Let's just uh, hand it down there to him. We're about yeah. 10 seconds from air time here. We'll just take it out of the way for a moment. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'd like to thank as many of you, thank you all for coming out. As many of you managed to make it, it was good to see a, a good crowd out here for this. Uh, for a long time, we've had a lot of requests uh, from members of the media to uh, get an experience in the shuttle mission simulator. Uh, as most of you know, the, the SMS area has been in a, a DOD secure zone for several years, and it's been real difficult for us to arrange these kind of things. And we did manage to put together um, an entire day uh, over there for tomorrow. And one of the things we're doing to make this an educational experience for everybody is to hold this background briefing uh, with some of the people who work with the shuttle mission simulator and crew training to give you an idea of um, uh, some of the things you're going to see tomorrow, uh, what we do with the SMS, and uh, particularly the briefings today are on the shuttle ascent and the ascent aborts. Um, uh, a lot of you have expressed interest in learning more about the dynamic phases of flight and we hope to be able to give you that experience with the briefing today and with the uh, shuttle mission simulator runs tomorrow. Uh, I need to go, uh, let me go ahead and introduce the people up here with me today and then I'm going to go to some logistics and tell you about some of the, the uh, things you need to know for tomorrow's activity. Uh, to my right is Frank Hughes, Chief of the Flight Training Branch over in uh, Building 4. Uh, and uh, to his right is Andy Foster, who is Shuttle Mission Simulator Instructor. Um, Frank will be here to um, answer some questions for a while, and then I believe he's probably going to have to leave early. Andy will be giving the briefings. Uh, there are really two briefings of about an hour apiece, so we're going to be here till about 5 o'clock. Uh, there are handout materials out on the table if you have not already picked some up. And uh, I think... Uh, Andy, I don't know how you, whether you have these structured for people to pause and ask questions or not. Probably uh, go straight on through and ask some questions uh, at the end. Or... I'd really like to, to con conduct this for you like I conduct this for the people here at JSC. And uh, I think it's better and I feel more comfortable with having you ask questions as we go along. So if you have something that you don't understand, stop me right then. Let's talk about it, get it straight, and then we'll press ahead. Um, one thing that uh, it's not a mandatory part of this, but there is a... Uh, a beer party at, uh, as soon as we get finished with this at about 5.30 over at the outpost that we've arranged. Uh, that's not required, but uh, you're encouraged to attend that. Uh, we can give you instructions on how to get there after the press conference. Uh, other logistical arrangements that let me go through rather quickly. Uh, you may have already got a piece of paper that looks like this with your name and the time that you're going to be uh, going in the simulator. If you don't already have that, Marilyn, our secretary, has those out there, one with your name on it. If there's not one with your name on it, uh, I'll be out there later also with the schedule and we'll make sure that you know what time uh, you are to go to the simulator because it is rather tightly scheduled uh, and if, if we miss your time, we won't be able to reschedule you. So it's very important that you're in the right place at the right time and that we let you know where to be and see that you get there. Um, we're divided up into groups. We're going to be using both the fixed and motion-based simulators. Uh, over there, there will be essentially room for three people plus the uh, uh, instructor in each one of these runs. The instructors in this case will be a member of the astronaut corps uh, who will be in the commander's seat and then we have the other three seats available uh, for reporters and we have scheduled you all to go in at, at certain times. Um, we will not be using motion on the motion-based simulator for a variety of reasons. Uh, the run times are staggered where uh, they're about 30 minutes apart. One simulator will start its run on the hour and the other will start its on the half hour. You will be doing return to launch site aborts, which will give you some experience in both the uh, launch and an abort situation and landing. And uh, those uh, generally take about 35 to 40 minutes. If there is time and things have gone smoothly and we've gotten everybody through the door at the right time, we'll try and run um, an additional normal ascent uh, during the time you're in there. That may or may not be possible, but we'll, uh, if we've got the time, we'll try and squeeze that in. Um, on, the, uh, on the piece of paper that I held up that, that everyone will get, it will show the group designation that you're in. If it says RG1, that's Reporters Group 1. Uh, uh, 
and it'll show the other members of the, the people in your group or if you're, for example, AP, I just put AP down there and you all know who you are, uh, hopefully. Um, there will be, there's a depart time from the JSC building to lobby. That is the time that we will walk out the door here and load you into the bus that we will provide to take you over to building five. So if you want to be here 15 minutes ahead of that time, uh, that's a good idea. Uh, the SMS run time and the instructor station time are on there just for your information. You only really need to know what time to be here and we'll take you from there. But you will have essentially an hour in the shuttle mission simulator and an hour at the instructor station uh, observing a run from the instructor station. I understand that the folks working there will be happy to talk to you as they go along and, and you can uh, listen also on headsets or handsets um, as to what's going on and you can hear it from that end. Uh, talking with them yesterday, it sounds like they're going to make it a lot of fun for you. And uh, Frank has worked real hard with his folks to make this an interesting experience. Uh, you will be able to take cameras and recording equipment into the simulator area. Um, that's uh, taken an act of Congress practically and, and we have that uh, set up for you. There will be some security business where we take you over there and while we've got hopefully everybody's name on the memo to get in the building, security will still look at everybody's badge and probably look at your camera equipment and it may take us 15 minutes to get the group through the door and we'll be taking like six people at a time every 30 minutes so there'll be like 12 of you in the building at once. <clears throat> so I just wanted you to know that would, that would also be taking place and be sure to have your whatever JSC NASA badge that, that you have that has allowed you to be here today whether it was temporarily uh, issued just for the couple of days here or whether you have a permanent badge you must have that uh, with you tomorrow. I think that's just about it. Uh, we do have uh, uh, videotape copies of what you saw we were playing earlier. We have the SMS tour tape which was I believe produced by some of the uh, Rockwell people as an introduction for, for new folks coming to NASA and we thought it was good and we stole it and uh, made copies of it for you and then we shot some stuff in the shuttle mission simulator over return to launch site abort that shows you all the graphics and the instruments and everything. Uh, you can borrow copies of those if you're um, you know, either to check them out from our film video distribution library or we have some copies back here with our media services people. Um, so those should be available also. Um, I think that's just about it. Uh, if you have any other questions on logistics, it uh, would be good to ask me now. Um, I will be out in the newsroom afterwards. And um, with no questions right now, we'll just go ahead and, and start. Uh, Frank, do you have anything to say or Andy? Yeah. Okay, we will have a <coughs> distribution box um, set up at each simulator. Uh, our audio people are setting up so you can plug in and get the audio. It's essentially the air to ground loop. It, uh, if you want to get the ambient noise from within the simulator, you'd have to have a little pocket uh, recorder or something like that. Uh, or you can have the microphone on your, on your camera. Uh, for those of you in the network television people and you're going to be uh, uh, in the fixed base simulator which has I think probably a little more room. There won't be any seats mounted to the floor back there so that the camera people can move around and uh, <clears throat> you won't have to be you know sitting down and, and uh, we'll be able to move around and get the sound with your camera as well. Okay let's uh, just a couple items. Um, I'd like to emphasize two things. One that Steve said uh, you've heard a lot before about launch windows with NASA. These are the simulated doors. I mean when they open them and close them they're going to be closed so it's really important to be prompt over here so we can keep the flow of people moving through. And the other thing is especially anybody that's bringing equipment in with them that we're going to want you to move you know really smoothly through that thing so we can keep this thing on time so that everybody gets a shot at it because it's a kind of a one-time venture and we want to make sure that everybody gets a shot. Um, the other thing is just by way of introduction to Andy Foster here who is uh, been flying F-14s in the Navy for a number of years and has been with us about three years. He comes to us with a lot of good credentials and as if he didn't know everything that he was going to speak about today, we've got a group of other instructors in the back of the room who came over to, to look out for this thing. We, I, I'm fortunate to have a, a, a cadre of individuals working for me that are superb down to every individual and uh, they intend to try to do a job for you tomorrow. We hope to be able to show you a little bit about what the crew sees and what they go through in the cockpit end of it, 
And then on the reverse side, uh, you'll get to see what life is like as an instructor and see how we get to terrorize the crews. So, I'd like to also mention that uh, from Singer Link, we have Pete Savello. Pete, could you stand up there? He's uh, from Singer Link and has brought along some material also from, from their organization that's out there. And if you have questions about the function of the simulator or some of the things from, from their end, uh, he's available to talk to also. Okay. Very good. We'll turn it over to Andy. Okay. You got it. All right, let me have the first slide, please. Okay, this is what we're here for, Asset Center Overview, and my purpose in the first briefing is to give you a good understanding of the basic flight profiles that we use to fly nominal ascents and some of the procedures that we use to fly nominal ascents. Let me have the next slide. Okay, to make sure that we're all on the same footing, what I'd like to do first is cover some of the terms and acronyms that I'm going to use uh, during the briefing, and not only is this something that good for you guys, but for the new people that report in here where we also do this briefing. You may hear me a couple of times today refer to a term called alpha. And uh, the formal term for that is angle of attack. And basically, it's just the, the angle between the orbiter x-axis and the wind hitting it. So what that means is if my hand's the orbiter and here's the wind is my finger, it's the angle between the orbiter and the wind. And that's what we call alpha or angle of attack. You may hear that term a couple of times today. Apogee. Well, apogee, if we have an orbit and my hand's the earth and we're going around it, most orbits are elliptical. In other words, they're not perfectly circular. One point in that orbit will be higher than the other point. The high point is apogee. Attitude, it's where the vehicle's pointed. My nose is way up, that's nose up attitude. Down's what nose down attitude, so forth. Azimuth, okay, it's direction the vehicle is headed. We normally refer to that in degrees from magnetic north. All right. It's kind of like looking at a compass. If you're, if, you're, if you're walking due east, your azimuth will be 090, okay? Uh, the BFS is the backup flight system, and basically it's a very simple software set. We usually load it into number five of the five GPCs that we have and hold it in reserve to use to control the vehicle should we have uh, problems with the primary avionics set. Uh, you'll hear me use the term gimbal. Of course, we all know there's big rocket engines on the back of the orbiter, both on the SRBs and, and uh, on the main engines and even the little ohms engines. And the way we uh, achieve vehicle control in powered flight is that we move these nozzles up, down, like this, back and forth. And by doing that, of course, we change the direction of thrust and that moves the vehicle around, okay? So you hear me the term, the term gimbal and engine basically means to move one of these nozzles, like that. Uh, the GPC is a general purpose computer. There are five of them on board the orbiter. Uh, four of them, we keep a software set that we call the prim primary avionics software set. You'll hear the instructors and myself refer to it as the PASS. And that's generally what we use to control the vehicle. It has a lot of really neat stuff in it. We keep the BFS kind of as a separate set. The idea behind it being that when people go and write this flight software in the past, if they make a mistake, we have a separate group of people over here uh, who are writing the BFS, and they wouldn't make the same mistake, hopefully. So it keeps us out of uh, what we call generic software errors. Uh, there's one mention in the briefing about the term iLoad. We go into the software in certain cases, and we tell it the value of some parameter or something that we want it to know. And when we specify that somewhere on the software, that's called an iLoad. It's like pulling something out of your memory, a number that you may have stored in your head. Uh, MECO is main engine cutoff. Uh, the ohms is the orbital maneuvering system. Again, using the model, the little rocket engines right back here, they provide about 6,000 pounds of thrust. Their fuel is all up here in the pods. And uh, we use those basically to change orbits once we, uh, we've gotten out of the atmosphere and also to bring us back in. Next slide, please. Any questions over the first one before I press on? Everybody with me? All right. Okay, perigee is a low point in an elliptical orbit, just the opposite of the apogee, and I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. When I say pitch, it's just a nose up and down movement, be a movement like this, whether it's of the orbiter or the whole vehicle. Okay? We talked about the PASS already. That acronym stands for Primary Avionics Software System. and. Uh, and the interesting point is that the four computers that are all operating the PASS system are all talking back and forth to each other, and they're all operating uh, at the same time doing exactly the same function. And that's where we get our, our redundancy. Uh, roll is movement around the orb longitudinal axis, so that's this type of movement this way. So we talked about pitch and roll so far. And then we have the big solid rocket boosters here on the side, and they're just what the name implies. These are solid propellant rocket engines, and uh, we use these to help us out and get us through first stage, all right? 
The SSMEs are the orbiter main engines back here. It stands for Space Shuttle Main Engine. And we have three of these, and their propellant supply comes from this big external tank that the orbiter is mounted on. All right. Uh, under speed is a term meaning that the desired velocity was not achieved. When we go for an orbit, we have to have a certain velocity to make that orbit. If we don't get there for whatever reason, uh, we're short of it. That's what we call an underspeed. And you'll hear that term mentioned in the briefing. And then final term is yaw, which is the nose left to right, which is like this. So the attitudes are a pitch, and then roll here, and then yaw this way. Any questions about any of the terms? Golly, you guys are with me. All right, great. Let's press ahead. OK, the basic purpose of the, the briefing is to provide a real basic familiarity uh, with the shuttle profiles that we fly. And just to go over the basic flight profile, of course, we have a launch down here. Uh, the first thing we do for that, and we'll get into all these things in a little more detail as we light the three main engines. And then once the GPCs on the orbiter are con convinced that they're OK, then it lights off the two solid propellant rocket boosters, and off we go. There's a pitch and roll program that puts us into the proper orientation to continue up, which happens right after we clear the tower. And again, I'll go into this in a little more detail. The next major event that happens is our SRB separation right up here. It's about two minutes, somewhere around 150 to 160,000 feet. We've burned up all the fuel in these two solid propellant rocket motors, so now they're nothing more than empty weight, and we really don't need to try to go uphill with all that stuff. So we kick it off, and then they're recovered and reused, hopefully. Uh, then the vehicle continues on its flight trajectory, and finally we get to the point in the orbit or the point in the sky where we want to go, hopefully, with both the proper angle and the proper speed. And then the main engine's cut off. And then we have this big external tank that's underneath us, and we really don't want to carry that up with us either. So at that point, we separate it from the orbiter, and uh, there's a little valve up here that'll tumble it, and it'll fall back into the atmosphere. Now, depending on the type of flight profile that we fly, uh, we may, at that point, do an ohms burn. In other words, we'll burn these little rocket engines I talked about right here. And again, I'll go into this a little more in detail. Uh, we may burn them right after the main engine shut down, or we may wait and burn them a little later, depending on how much velocity we have. Again, earlier I referred to apogee and perigee, and this is the Earth right here. And we're looking kind of down on an orbit, and just to, I uh, just drew this way out so that you could get a good idea of an elliptical orbit. And you can see apogee's way up here and perigee's way down there. So, all right. Any questions so far? Yes, sir. Andy, um, what, will we be a participant in this at all, or and also what kind of dress? Are we going to have coveralls like you guys use, or should we wear uh, sports shirts and trousers or whatever you we want to wear? You mean for the SMS runs tomorrow? Right. Uh, you're just going to be normal clothes. If you have questions about the SMS operation, I'd really rather wait and hold those, and, and let's keep the questions during the briefing addressed to the briefing, if you don't mind. OK, well, I wanted to know, because I used to be a simulator instructor, and I wanted to know if we were going to uh, participate in this ourselves from the right seat so that I could follow a little more closely on this. If we're just going to be a passenger, then uh, that's a different approach. OK. Let's have the next slide, please. OK, I guess, you know, as far as commenting to that, what you get out of this is really up to you like it is to any student. And I'm up here as an instructor, so that's kind of where that is. OK, we're talking in this briefing about nominal ascents. And by that, we're going to mean that everything goes OK. We have a real nice day. And we have two types of nominal ascents that we perform. We're going to talk first about an ascent called a standard insertion. OK. Basically, whether we're doing a standard insertion or the other type, we'll get to in a minute. We have three major flight phases. We're first stage, which starts from launch and goes through SRB separation. Second stage, which goes from SRB separation until MECO, or main engine cutoff. Okay, and this is the point. Now we get rid of the external tank just a few seconds later. Now, about two minutes after uh, the main engine's cut down, we're going to do an ohms burn. We're going to fire those ohms engines on the back of the orbiter. And this is to basically push us into orbit. Right here, for a standard insertion, we don't have quite enough velocity to get into orbit at that point. So we use the ohms engines to help us out. This phase of flight is also referred to as the insertion phase. In other words, it's inserting us into an orbit. Okay. Now, after this, the orbit that we have will be elliptical, like the very first one that I showed you a page or so ago. 
So, and what we'd like to do is circularize that orbit. It does a lot of pretty neat things for us. So about 45 minutes later, we're going to perform an ohms 2 burn. In other words, we're going to burn those ohms engines again. And the timing of that burn make, will make our orbit circular. Okay. So this is a standard insertion flight. Powered flight here, orbital insertion ohms 1, and circularization ohms 2. Those are your, your three basic parts of a standard insertion. Let me have the next flight. Okay, we kind of went through this a little bit and go through it again. Just briefly, first phase, or powered flight, consists of two stages. First stage begins at SRB separation and ends, or I'm sorry, SRB ignition and ends at SRB separation. Second stage will go from SRB separation until main engine cutoff. And then we have the orbital insertion phase, which will begin uh, actually with the ET sep, uh, and then uh, we'll go through the ohms one burn. At the end of that, we're at the end of the insertion phase, and then we'll do an orbital circularization phase with the ohms two. Now down here at the bottom, what I've done is put some drawings that come give you an idea, a good representation of what all this is going to look like. You can see we launch here, and the main engine's cut off. And as you can see, if we didn't do anything, we'd hit our apogee or a high point in the orbit somewhere after Miko, and we wouldn't have enough velocity to go all the way around. So obviously, we're not quite in orbit. So what we do is we burn our ohms one, use the ohms engines to add that velocity that we need, and that gives us an orbit. And it'll be an elliptical orbit, not a circular one. So then we'll wait, and when we get to, actually to uh, apogee over here, that we created with this burn, we'll burn the engines again, and that'll give us a nice round circular orbit. Okay. Any questions over standard insertion? Okay, let's have the next slide. Okay. Yeah, I've got a question. Yes. Is uh, Ohm's one at, at apogee always? No, uh, Ohm's one is going to be it, it's going to be short of apogee. You, if you didn't do anything, you'd coast on up to an apogee, but you don't have enough velocity to make a full orbit. You would, Ohm's one is bef before apogee? Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Generally it is. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. The second type of nominal ascent is one we call a direct insertion. And we've been through a standard insertion, so I won't step through that again. But notice that the difference here is that there is no Ohm's one. In other words, we simply coast for about 45 minutes and then we burn in Ohm's two. Well, how do you do that? Well, the reason we can do this is that for some flights, of course, we're carrying heavier, heavier payloads than other flights. The flights where we're not carrying real heavy payloads, where we have additional performance out of the main engines, we can get enough velocity where we don't have to burn this Ohms 1. It'll actually take us to a point where just on the main engines alone, we can achieve orbit. That won't be a nice round circular orbit, but at least it'll get us up there. And then we'll just coast on to Ohms 2, and just like we did for the standard insertion, we'll burn at apogee of the orbit we've got, and that'll circularize the orbit for us. Okay. Any questions over that? So the, the concepts I want you to get here is the standard insertion and direct insertion. Standard insertion, you have your powered flight, ohms one, and ohms two. Direct insertion, you have powered flight and ohms two. Okay. All right. Andy? Yes. What's the outside envelope on uh, the orbit if you did not do the ohms burn after a direct ascent? Uh, how long are you good for? Well, on average. That's going to depend on the height of the perigee that you achieve. Uh, your, we generally consider an orbit below 85 nautical miles, uh, a perigee, an orbit with a perigee of below 80 or 85 nautical miles is an unsafe orbit. Uh, 85 nautical miles uh, gives us about three revolutions. Okay, and, and I can't really answer your question because each flight is, has a different HP at cutoff. If you had one that was above 85, it might be safe. Now, in general, you don't usually have a safe orbit. Okay. Yes? Uh, are we going to be using standard or direct tomorrow on our You're sims? You're going to be using direct insertion on the simulations tomorrow. Um, as the program has matured and we've gained more and more performance out of the vehicle, uh, Direct insertion has become the primary mode of ascent that we use. You're going to see standard insertion flights on flights like Space Lab flights, where we have very, very heavy payloads and that type of thing. Most of the time, you're going to see the direct insertion that we're just talking about. Any other questions? OK, let's have the next slide. 
Okay. Now what I'd like to do now is give you some real quick background. We've kind of looked at the two types of nominal ascents we do, and the question I want to answer now is how do we do them? So I'm going to give you a look at how we do it, and I'm going to take the crew's perspective so you get a little bit familiar with that. The, uh, nearly everything we do on the orbiter is uh, run by orbiter software, and what they did was basically construct the orbiter software to correspond to each um, major mission phase. So for ascent, and this is nominal ascent, we have what we call operational sequence one. You'll see that abbreviated around here as ops one. Okay? So ops one software is the computer software that basically controls the, uh, the shuttle vehicle during the ascent. Okay? Uh, we've broken that operational sequence down into major modes because we have you know, several different things that we do during an ascent. The first one, major mode 101, is our pre-launch. From T minus 20 minutes until liftoff, this is the software that's loaded into the orbiter computers. All right. Now, once we light off the SRBs, the software is aware of that, the computers know that, and they mode into major mode 102. As you can see, it says first stage liftoff to SRB separation. So if you hear people talking about major mode 102, that means we're in first stage flight. Once we kick off the SRBs, now we go to major mode 103, and these transitions are all automatic within the orbiter computers. The crew doesn't uh, normally have to do anything to get them. Major mode 103 will take us from SRB separation until the point where we kick off the external tank. 104 takes us through the OMS-1 maneuver. Okay. Major mode 105 is there to handle OMS-2. And then we have a period of time where we've gotten into our orbit, but we need time to configure for our on-orbit software and get the vehicle ready. So we just have a major mode 106 that just allows us to coast. Okay. All right. Any questions about this software setup? Just understand that we're what the basic operational sequence is or how the setup is and what the major modes are. All right. Okay, so now we've kind of taken a look at what an ascent is. We're going to look at how do we do this? You know, how does the crew do this? How do they go about it? Well, of course, the first thing you've got to do is get into it, and I'm not going to go into that in detail. There's a lot of training that goes on just from that end. But once the crew gets into the uh, orbiter, they pick up a checklist just like any other air crew. You'll hear that referred to around here as the flight data file. Okay? We have a checklist that covers nominal ascent procedures. In other words, you know, th the things that we normally do to fly the vehicle and that is called the ascent checklist, and this is where the crew picks up. So you'll see in the checklist a timeline like this, minus one hour and 50 minutes. That is in terms of, uh, if you want to call it count time, uh, and this is the real time because we have two 10-minute holds. That's why there's a 20-minute difference. So in terms of how the, the events are going to go, this is at T minus one hour and 50 minutes. In terms of how long before you really launch, if you were looking at your watch, it's two hours and 10 minutes. And it just has ingress orbiter and seats and has them start setting up their communication systems to correspond uh, with the Launch Control Center. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, again, I'm only going to hit uh, the very, some of the very, I'm going to hit the highlights of what they do. I explained this first already. Uh, the next major thing that you're going to hear from the crew is that uh, an hour and 30 minutes, Launch Control Center is basically going to give a call to the crew. They're going to check out all the communication loops, not only between the LCC and the vehicle, but they're going to want to respond with each and every person uh, in there so they can make sure that everybody can talk and everybody can hear. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, what I did was take the, the actual timeline and just kind of condense it a little bit and I'll just give you a real quick uh, one-liner explanation of some of these events. Uh, some of the major events that we're going to look at is that in an hour and ten we're going to do a cabin leak check. The way we're going to do that is we're going to overpressurize the cabin to make sure that the valves and everything work correctly. Uh, that's going to begin right here. At about an hour, we're going to align the IMUs. I don't think I included this term, but this is inertial measurement unit. And what these things do is basically they keep track of where the orbiter is without anything external. Like, and what we have to do, though, before we can use these things is we've got to tell them where we are, and we've got to get them into the proper orientation. So that's something called pre-flight pre alignment. And this is where the crew begins to get uh, those systems online. They're going to do another air-to-ground voice check, However, this one's going to be with Mission Control rather than the Launch Control Center at about 25 minutes before launch. Now, if you, min if you remember a moment ago, we talked about Ops 1. Up until this point, there's been another software set in the Orbiter GPCs called Ops 9, and its function is simply pre-launch. That's all it knows how to do. 
Now we're getting to the point where we're close to the launch profile. We want to get the Ops 1 software into the computer so it's going to know what to do when we tell it we want to take off. Okay. So at T minus 20, when we go into this 10 minute, 10 minute hold, or actually uh, I believe as we come out of it, we're going to do uh, an Ops 1 load. We're going to load that software uh, into the orbiter GPCs and uh, have it there for our use. Remember we talked about the BFS. You can see that uh, what we're going to do at this point is we're going to tell the BFS We've taken the pass here to Ops 1. Now at T minus 19, we're going to tell the BFS, we want you to go to Ops 1 also. So they're both doing the same thing. Okay. There's a display they call the horizontal situation config. You should see that tomorrow, or you may see that tomorrow. And what this does is allow the crew to check to the landing sites in case of some type of uh, SN abort. And we'll talk about the SN aborts in a few minutes. They can actually go into the software and select the site that they're going to use. Uh, at T minus 16 minutes, uh, we're going to do a few things to the main propulsion system. In other words, those main engines that are on the back uh, to get them ready for launch. And their crew is also going to receive a weather update. At T minus 9 minutes, we go into a normal 10 minute hold. And assuming that uh, if they're having any problems, that they're cleared up, uh, that that time when we come out of it, the crew is then given a go for launch. Let me have the next slide, please. Okay, and as far as the launch sequence at the T minus nine point, the ground launch sequencer uh, at the Cape, which is a big computer, runs everything all automatically. It's doing everything that needs to be done. At about seven minutes before launch, they retract the access arm that the crew used to crawl into the vehicle. Uh, we start up the auxiliary power units that we use, uh, not only to move these main engines on the orbiter, but also the aero surfaces when we decide to come back later on during an entry. Uh, or if we have to do an entry, like you'll see for an RTLS, the uh, auxiliary power units basically provide the hydraulic power that move those aero surfaces around. Okay, and they also move the main engines. So we do a pre-start procedure here, kind of get them ready to start up. At T minus five minutes, we go ahead and bring those guys up online. Okay, and there are three of those in the orbiter. Any questions? Yeah. At what point in our, in our sim will we start? Where, where in the count? I think you're probably going to start at uh, T minus 2, I imagine. Yeah, T minus 2. Okay. So where you're going to come up is you're going to be actually inside this, and we'll get to that in just a second. Uh, yeah. Yes? On the preceding chart, uh, when, when, the, when the backup flight system is configured to OPS 1, right. is the del why, why is it configured separately We're 10 minutes after the other? Is there a reason for that? Uh, well, it's not 10 minutes after. The Ops 101 load actually comes at the end of the 10 minute count. And, and the way the crew uh, does that, the, the BFS at, at um, well, it's not an automatic transition. It's just set up that way. Uh, and uh, once the crew loads Ops 1 into the pass and they know they've got it, then they simply just tell the BFS, okay, we want you to go to, the, to 101. I don't know if that answers your question, but. No, I was just wondering, does, does it have to be, could, could you not just do it all at one time? That's the question. I'm just wondering why they're, why they're done separately. That's well, you always want to make sure that you have the pass loaded up before the BFS, because you're not going to fly on the BFS first. So if you encounter a problem there, you know. Okay. Any other questions? All right. I think, let's see, we were down to T minus four minutes. You'll hear the, uh, the launch control center ask the crew to close visors on their launch helmets uh, at three, three uh, minutes and 25 seconds. The uh, main engines will be moved, and, and they'll be moved through gimbal checks. And again, that's these things. They'll be moved from stop to stop in the orbiter GPCs. They'll watch all that movement and make sure that they do move uh, as they're commanded to. And as long as that goes correctly, at three minutes and uh, three minutes and ten seconds, and the main engines are commanded to uh, their start position, uh, there's a caution and warning system on board the vehicle that records uh, things that go wrong, and it kind of remembers some of those things and. Uh, if they've had any problems up here that they've cleared up, they'll go through here, whether they do or not, and clear this caution warning memory. And that's so that once you launch, any alerts you get uh, are the ones that have occurred since you started flying. So you don't get confused between the ones that happened pre-launch and the ones that we launched with. Okay, next slide. Okay. Um, the uh, next thing that, that's really going to happen in terms of major events is at T minus 28 seconds, uh, up until this point, uh, the ground launch sequencer at the Cape has been controlling all the launch functions. It's basically been telling the orbiter what to do. When we get to this point, the orbiter GPCs, the computers on board, the space shuttle, to basically take over the launch sequence. And the GLS just sits back and kind of monitors and listens
for what's going on and responds uh, if they have any problems. But the orbiter GPCs command the launch sequence, start taking over everything. Uh, if the operators at the Cape, they can still monitor all the orbiter systems, and if they see a problem, uh, they can issue uh, a hold, which will just stop the count. And if you've done that, then you may want to recycle and start it over again if you clear up your problem. Uh, the next major thing that happens is about 6.8 seconds, then we start up the main engines, and it's staggered uh, by just milliseconds. The uh, computers will monitor that engine start sequence. It'll look to make sure that all three main engines are up to 90% thrust or better. It'll give them four seconds to do that. And uh, if, uh, if that doesn't happen, then they'll go out and basically shut the main engines down again without taking any other actions. However, normally it, it does uh, happen. We get all three engines up, and when they meet those conditions, then it commands the SRB ignition sequence. Okay. Uh, once, uh, if you're inside the vehicle, once the uh, SRBs light up, you're going to feel the vehicle rock. And uh, obviously that's not a good thing to get excited about, so just stay in your seat. We call that the twang. And we, we've timed it so the vehicle does straighten up before uh, we, uh, actually, I'm sorry, it's the main engines that light off that cause the twang. And, uh, and uh, we make sure the vehicle straightens up before we light the SRBs. Um, well, you're running with no motion, but you will be able to see it. If you look out the side window, we normally have the, the launch tower up kind of over on the left where it normally is. And you'll see the twang. It's very, very noticeable. Okay. Okay, uh, zero in our count is SRB ignition. Uh, once you light the SRBs, you're going. And this is the, when the software mode's into major mode 102, and that's our lift off. At <coughs> roughly seven seconds, uh, after uh, we lift off, we'll be clear of the tower, and then we do a pitch and roll maneuver. And what that basically does, remember we talked about pitch and roller, so we're coming off the pad straight, we get clear of the tower, and then we're going to start pitching down, we're going to start rolling, and this is going to put us in the proper uh, launch plane, basically, uh, get us going in the right direction, the one we want to head out from the cape from, okay? Okay, the next major thing that happens during the ascent <laughs> is at about 30 seconds. Uh, the SSS, SSMEs, or the main engines in the back of the orbiter, throttle down. Let me have the next slide. We refer to that as the throttle bucket. Okay. The reason we do that is to reduce aerodynamic loads that we, uh, we have on the vehicle. We also do use the orbiter aero surfaces, in other words, these elevons back here. We move them around so that the air loads on these wings are reduced. So we're doing two things at that point. We're uh, throttling the main engines down a little bit, because if you think about it, that, that when you, uh, the air loads in the vehicle are, are a function of how fast am I going. So if I throttle the main engines down a little bit, when I get to this real thick part of the air, then I'm not going to uh, create as high an air load on the vehicle as I would if I left the main engines up. So we throttle them down to reduce the loads, yes? In the sim run tomorrow, how deep is the bucket? Uh, is that's a single stage 65, I believe from 104, which is where we normally fly. Yeah, you'll see the, if you watch the engines, you'll see them at 100 until we're tower clear, and then 104, and then 65. Okay, uh, we obviously don't want to keep uh, the main engines throttled back too long, because the whole time interval where we throttle these main engines back, well, yeah, we got our aerodynamic loads in a real good place, but we're losing performance, you know, and we'd really like that. I mean, our objective here is to get in orbit. So as soon as we can throttle the main engines back up, which usually occurs at about one minute, up they go again, and you'll hear a call from Mission Control, and they'll just give you a go at throttle up call to the crew. Okay. The next major thing is that two minutes, uh, what's happened now is we burned out most of the propellant in the SRBs. So uh, as that propellant burns up and uh, exhausts itself, the thrust will begin to fall off. And uh, we monitor the uh, chamber pressure or the pressure inside the SRBs, and you'll hear the crews refer to that as PC, and it stands for chamber pressure. And what we look for is less than 50 PSI, in other words, 50 pounds per square inch. And that will be indicated on one of the trajectory displays that you'll see. You'll see a little PC less than 50 flash at you, telling, that, telling you that the SRBs uh, basically have started to die out. And that is also the key to the software to begin the SRB separation sequence. All right. It takes about six seconds for that sequence uh, to occur. And so somewhere around 206, you'll see the SRBs kick off the vehicle and then we get into major mode 103. This is our second stage flight. And second stage guidance will take over. 
And what I'd like to do is, is talk to you just a second or so about guidance. Okay, what is guidance? Well, guidance is software that we use to control the vehicle. You may hear the term navigation, which is another set of software. Navigation basically uh, keeps track of where the vehicle is. And then navigation tells guidance where it is. Guidance knows where it is and then knows where it wants to go and computes the actions that it needs to get there. So guidance controls the vehicle to get it where you want it to go. Now during first stage, we use what we call an open loop guidance scheme. And what we mean is, is that we don't really check to see how well we're doing. The only thing the vehicle does is it looks on how fast am I going, and when it figures that out, it sets a pitch and a, and a yaw. Okay, so it just says if I'm going, say, uh, Mach 1, it's going to have this attitude, Mach 2, it's going to have this attitude, Mach 3, it's going to have this attitude. All right. So that's the kind of guidance scheme it uses. When we go to second stage, the guidance scheme changes. We have a very specific point in the sky out here we want to get to. We want to get to there, there with, with a certain angle. We want to get there with a certain velocity. Okay? So we're going to do everything it takes to make sure that we do that. So to be able to achieve that, what we've got to do is, is uh, know where, not only where I am, but how am I doing? How am I doing getting to this point over here? And that's called closed loop. In other words, it's continuously checking on its progress. So when we get to second stage, we have a closed loop guidance scheme. Uh, you probably won't, uh, you'll just hear it called powered flight guidance, usually by the crews. The technical term for it is powered explicit guidance one, because there are several uh, guidance schemes that we use. Both the PASS and the BFS uh, use this same type of targeting. So the guidance schemes in both software sets are the same. Well, when we get in here and we do we, this transition between uh, first stage and second stage, now what happens is it's kind of like turning on your car, you know. You crank up your car and you've got to see whether it's running. Well, the crew does the same thing with the guidance scheme. The second stage of guidance is cranked up and it starts figuring out, you know, where am I? Okay, here's where I am, here's where I want to go. And it starts making all these nice little computations to get you there. Well, they have some cues as to whether or not it's doing its job. Does it know where it's going? And, the, and if it knows where it's going, we, f we call that guidance converging. You think of this number here and you're kind of moving in on it, you're converging on it, okay? So they'll check, they'll give it 10 seconds to converge and there's some cues that they'll use to look at. And if it doesn't, then they'll take over the vehicle and fly it manually or engage the BFS depending on what kind of a situation they're in. Yes, sir? Uh, there are two primary cues that you use on the ascent trajectory display. There's a number called T-MECO or time of maintenance and cutoff. Uh, what they'll do is they'll look to see what number that is and they know what that number should be and they'll check to make sure that that number is the one they're looking for. They'll also do the same thing on the BFS and check to make sure that those two both have computed the correct number. Uh, there's a, on the attitude indicator that they have, there are some air needles that they use to fly with. And uh, if guidance goes unconverged, those guys go and they just stow out of the way. And it's another second indication that, that guidance is unconverged. So those are the two primary things they're going to look for. Mainly, uh, they're going to look for that number on the tragedy display and make sure it's the correct one. Any other questions? Yes, sir. All velocities will be inertial unless stated otherwise? Um, yeah, if you, when you look at the tapes tomorrow, the first stage, it's, it's actually be real relative velocity, but once you go into the second stage, it's all inertial. Okay, any other questions? Okay, let's see, next slide. Okay, after this, if uh, guidance has converged, all the crew is going to do is monitor both the vehicle performance via the trajectory displays, and they're going to, of course, look at their systems and make sure that everything's working correctly. Uh, basically, if there's if everything is going correctly, they should not have to do anything other more other than monitor the vehicle. That should be it. The next major event that's going to occur is what we call 3G throttling. Now, if you think about it, I can't. The SRBs are still on this model, but we, as we fly into ascent, we're using propellant out of this external tank, so this is getting lighter and lighter and lighter. At the same time, rocket engines don't really like to operate in an atmosphere. They're much more efficient in a vacuum. They're designed for that. So the engine efficiency is improving and we're getting lighter in the vehicle. So what is this doing? Well, it's starting to make us go faster. We're accelerating faster. And the vehicle basically uh, was designed to uh, take a 3G structural load. 
Well, we actually get to the point in the flight profile where we're accelerating so quickly that we hit three Gs. If we didn't do something at this point, we would actually go start accelerating past that three G structural limit. So what we do to maintain the three Gs is we begin bringing the throttles down on the main engines. The software can see the G level and it'll begin to throttle the main engines down just to maintain that three Gs. Again, it's a compromise. I don't want to exceed three Gs, but I don't want to cut my engines down any more than I have to because I need the performance to take me up into orbit. Okay? And you'll hear that uh, term is 3G throttling. Now, this is during a nominal ascent. If you just get to see the RTLS, you'll never see, you'll never see 3G throttling. But hopefully you'll get a nominal also. Okay, the next major thing that, that happens, as you can see, this is very late in the flight profile. Uh, the next major thing is main engine cutoff. We should have achieved the target that we were going for. The crew has some uh, instruments they're going to look at, and they can actually see how fast they were going. The readout to them is in feet per second which is something we use around here all the time. So for most flights these days, you're looking somewhere between around 25,800 feet per second, something like that as a rough number. What's the usual cutoff time? Uh, normally, it's about 8 minutes and 30 seconds, something like that. Okay. Again, those numbers are going to vary depending on how much payload am I carrying and what kind of orbit do I want to achieve. All that's going to drive that stuff. 18 seconds after the main engine's cut off, uh, and this is because the software is going through and doing all kinds of neat little things to prepare for this. This external tank is, is then separated from the vehicle. Okay. There's some uh, umbilicals that are pulled back and then some pyrotechnics are fired and the tank will begin to move away. To make sure that we don't hit the tank because we're in a vacuum and it's coasting at the same velocity we are, we fire our reaction control system jets back underneath here and on the nose that will kind of, let me hold this up like this, that would push the orbiter this way away from the tank. We call that a minus Z translation, and that has to do, we go X, Y, and actually positive Z is this way, so this is minus Z that way. So you hear a term minus Z translation, what it's talking about is the orbiter moving this way. Okay, so we, we push it back with the reaction control system jets until we get a rate back of about four feet per second, and then the software shuts them off. At that time, the software then goes into major mode 104. Now, if you remember, that is the software mode where we do the Ohm's 1 burn if we're doing a standard insertion mission. Okay. If we're doing a direct insertion mission, it'll still go to major mode 104. It's just we don't execute an Ohm's burn. We just kind of let the software sit there and idle and not do anything, and the crew presses ahead with other actions. And then when they get to a specific point in the checklist, then they go to major mode 105 and then press ahead preparing for the Ohm's 2. Okay, one thing I did mention is this note here. They, you'll see a note in the checklist, or you may see it uh, when they separate from the tank. They just uh, check to make sure that the vehicle attitude stays real stable. Uh, they'll look at their cutoff velocity or their VI, and from that, plus some other information that they have on board, they can tell what kind of orbit they achieved on board. And then the ground also is, of course, doing their computations from their tracking data and they'll confirm to the crew that they're seeing the same thing that they are or make a recommendation if they need to. Any, ca any questions? Yes, sir. Tomorrow, if we have time and are in a normal ascent, does the runs on your normal ascents include uh, the abort shaping that I understand will be on uh, Mission 26 and also like STS-1 and 2 had where at the point it's called T-fail, you actually dive down. Yeah, T-fail logic is in this, I believe that's MR tomorrow, right? Is that right? I'm pretty sure it is. And that does have T-fail logic in it. Um, I'd so we would see that on a normal ascent. Well, I think there's still a lot of debate about whether or not that's going to be used and how much it's going to be used. Um, there's a, some pluses to it. You know, the plus to it is it gives you AOA capability sooner. And we'll talk about this for the rest of you because I know who this guy is and I know he understands what I'm talking about, I hope. But uh, it gives you AOA capability sooner, but there are some other drawbacks to it in terms of performance. And, of course, there's a fairly large pitch maneuver and some other things. But Well, just, just to hold it to the run itself, if, if we're flying a, a normal ascent without an abort tossed in, will you see it in the SMS? Oh, yes. Or? Mm -hmm. 
Do you for, know, for right now, for this particular software load that, that I think you're using tomorrow, yes. You would see that. Do you yes. know about how much you, uh, you dive down? It's about uh, 20 to 30 degrees, something like that. It's real healthy. That's the, that's the pitch angle below high, no, horizon. No, how much you pitch steep. down. You, you, pitch you basically down come down to uh, pretty close to a level attitude. Just, okay. Do you know how many feet you lose? No. You can check that for yourself if you get to it. Any other questions? Okay, next slide. Let's see how we're doing. Okay. We, uh, the crew at this point, if there has been a, a, if we're doing a standard insertion flight and there's been no underspeed, in other words, we got the velocity we we're looking for, they're going to use eye loaded targets in the software to perform the OMS 1. In other words, we've we fix this thing so it just all comes up automatically and the crew doesn't have to go in and tell it what kind of burn they want to do. If we have suffered an underspeed, if we lost a main engine early, we didn't quite get the performance that we were expecting to get, then the crew can target for an abort to or orbit OMS-1. And we'll talk about an abort to orbit in a little more detail in the next briefing, but basically it just means that we don't go to quite as high as we expected to. We're only going to try to go to 105 nautical mile orbit, and that's safe. Uh, or they'll set up for an abort once around, which basically means that we launch from the Cape, hopefully, and land at Edwards. And again, we'll go into this in a little more detail in the next briefing. Uh, once they've confirmed what their targeting is, and they'll do this with the flight data file that I mentioned, those targets are listed in there, and they'll also be talking to the ground. The ground will confirm for them what targets they have. The crew can, will maneuver to a, the proper burn attitude, and they'll do this usually just via the software. They can go in and say, okay, take me to the correct attitude, and the orbiter will just fly around to it, and then at the proper time, they execute the burn. They burn those ohms engines on the back end. Uh, we also, when we light off the ohms engines, we still have propellants trapped back in here because the plumbing from the external tank that takes fuel for the main engines runs up through the back end of the orbiter. Well, there's propellants trapped back there. We don't want to keep it in there for a couple of reasons. One is weight, center of gravity, and the other thing is that some of those propellants are highly corrosive. So we like to get them out of the orbiter. So what we do at that time is we basically just dump it out through the engines and through some valves on the side of the orbiter when we do this ohms burn. Okay. If we've done a direct insertion and we don't have an underspeed, uh, we still do that MPS dump or main engine propellant dump I was just talking about, but they'll do it with the switch manually rather than having the software do it. Uh, even if we're doing a direct insertion, if the main engines, if we've lost an engine at certain points in the flight profile or two of them, uh, we still might have to do an ohms one. We didn't get the velocity we needed out of the main engine, so we're going to go back and now use the ohms engines to give us that velocity. Now, we may or may not be able to go to a normal orbit. We may have to accept this ATO 105 nautical mile orbit, but at least we'll get to orbit. So the, I, the thing I'm trying to get across to you here is that you can be doing a direct insertion and still have to do an ohms one but it should be, probably will be, because you've suffered an underspeed of some sort. Okay. Any questions there? Okay, I'm just going to step real quickly through the checklist. Uh, these are the nominal ascent procedures. Uh, this is exactly what the crew is looking at. They have them on books that they'll have set up, and they're Velcroed up uh, basically to the window structure in the orbiter. The pilot and the commander both have one. And I don't remember this is a, what flight this was for. Uh, but basically, you can see it's telling them, okay, here's check for your roll program. This has to do with a flight instrument. Here's this throttle bucket that we talked about. It's telling them at this Mach number, you should see your main engines throttle down to 85, and at this Mach number, they should come back up. Okay, so that's that throttle bucket we talked about. Then it says, okay, here's your SRB separation. This is what you're looking for. Gives them some other conditions. Um, uh, once we get the SRBs off, we talked about guidance convergence. Well, that, what this, that's what this note is right here, T Miko, time of main engine cutoff on the displays that I was telling you about. They're going to look for that and check, make sure that it's stable. They're going to give it 10 seconds to stabilize. And if it's not and they don't have any communications, then they're going to take over. CSS stands for control stick steering, and that's when the crew manually flies the vehicle up. And they can also at that time will probably take uh, manual throttles. In other words, they can also manually throttle the main engines just like you step on the gas pedal of your car or take your foot off, either case. The next thing I'm going to do is go to here to main engine cutoff for this particular flight. This was the velocity they were looking for. So I suspect from that number, it's, that's probably a standard insertion. Uh, and this is a cue that if we were doing manual throttles, well, we have to take our reaction time into account. So 
we shut them down just a little bit early to do that. And then here's some more notes, ET, SEP, check our attitude within 10 degrees and check our targets just like we talked about. Any questions over this? Just a quick step through to give you an idea of what they're looking at. Okay, next one. Now we talked about this Ohm's one burn that we're doing. The crew has some targeting cards that they can look at and they didn't really put them in the package because they didn't want to get into all the targeting questions. But once they confirm those targets, they're going to put up these two cards. And, and for every Ohm's burn that we do, we have two cards. One is called a burn card. One is called a burn monitor card. Now what the burn card does is it first of all gives us nominal procedures. This is what I do to get ready for this burn. These are the actions that I have to take. Okay. Down here at TIG, you'll see that term a lot. That's called time of ignition. We usually refer to that uh, with the Ohm's engines. Uh, when TIG is zero, that means the Ohm's engine should be lighting up. Okay. And it tells them some, some things to check with those uh, Ohm's engines. Once the Ohm's burn begins, uh, there should be nothing for them to do if everything goes all right. However, if a problem crops up, the software generally will alert them to it. It'll give them a message and it'll send them over here to this burn monitor card or they'll know to go here. It doesn't send them over here. But they'll see the message and come over to this burn monitor card and using it, it gives them things to look for. What kind of indications do I have? Once you find out what kind of indications you have on this side of the card, you go over here and it tells you what to do. Now notice that in some cases it says like engine fail, ohms engine fail, ohms propellant fail, so forth. Okay, so now we've, uh, in this case for instance, we've determined that an ohms engine has failed. What do I do now? Well now I go back to the gray area on this card and I go to ohms engine fail and I start executing these procedures. So the white card here, on the white part of the ohms burn card is uh, nominal procedures. The gray area in the ohms burn card tells me uh, off nominal or when things go wrong, what do I do? And then the burn monitor card is a troubleshooting card. What do I have? So you see how you can you kind of jump back and forth, but you use these two cards uh, together to execute an ohms burn. And there's a set of cards like this also for ohms too. Yes, sir? Is the same person using both cards or is one doing uh, Usually the both burn the, card? Usually both the CDR and the PLT both have burn cards up. Okay. Yes, sir? An Ohm's engine does fail and it's critical to getting into orbit like you, uh, you were about flying a standard uh, ascent. Uh, what happens then? What do they do? You're going to complete the burn on a single Ohm's engine. I see. And then you're going to look at uh, uh, what kind of failure it was, whether it's an engine fail, propellant fail, uh, and how high, how high is my height of perigee at that point. And then you're going to take some other actions for Ohm's too. Okay. Okay. Would you under any circumstances uh, go ahead and and uh, continue without an abort on just one ohms engine. If you got one ohms engine burning successfully, would you continue on or would you uh, make preparations to bring the spacecraft down? Um, no, normally uh, you will c continue on uphill. You continue on on, on the strength but of it, one it, and do it again it's and gonna, add? It's going to depend on what kind of failure. But you, you consider adding velocity with on the strength of one engine? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, in that case, of course, that only leaves you one one engine for uh, re-entry then. And well, you also have RCS 4 plus X, yeah, 4 plus X down mode, so you're, you're still protected. Okay, and again, it's going to depend on a lot of different things that I really, you know, I'd have to get down with a flight data file because for each, each flight, that is taken into consideration. So from flight to flight, what we're going to do may change a little bit. Now, normally it doesn't change that much, but sometimes it does for different consideration. How much ohms propellant do I have loaded on board is another factor. I've got to have the uh, delta V capacity to be able to go uphill. And, and in some instances, you know, you may not be able to do that. And then you start looking at, okay, now I've got to come back. You can cross-feed cross out of the yes. dead engine into the other engine. Yes, you can. Okay. Assuming that it was an engine failure, not a propellant failure. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, the next card. Hang on, we're almost at the end here. I'll give you a break. Okay, after we do our OMS-1 or uh, after MECO, if we're doing a direct insertion, there's a section of the ascent checklist called the uh, post ohms one The crew presses on into there. Uh, some of the things they may have to do, uh, if we're going on an a AOA primarily here, uh, we'd like to keep our angle of attack low. Remember we talked about that. And uh, 
we're going to do a procedure called alpha management and just is a manual procedure where they'll kind of pitch the orbiter and, and kind of keep it streamlined as much as they can with what little bit of air there is up there. Uh, if we're not going to do an abort once around, this is the time we shut off the auxiliary power units and turn off our hydraulic power. We really don't need them anymore after that. We're not going to move our main engines around anymore. We're not going to move our aerosurfaces around anymore. They're not going to do any good for us. If we are going to do an AOA, we leave the APUs online, but we take the load off of them. The hydraulic pumps on board the orbiter have a kind of a normal position and a low position. So we just take them to low. That leaves the APUs online so we don't have to worry about shutting them down and trying to power them up. We just leave them running but we do take the load off of them by uh, taking, uh, depressurizing the hydraulic system a little bit. At, right around in this period, uh, we've done everything we needed to do. Post OMS 1, now we need to start setting up for OMS 2 burn. First thing we do is this is actually typed into the computer. On the computer keyboard, they'll do an OPS 105 Pro, which is basically saying to the software, proceed in the, to major mode 105. Software will transition over for us, and then they'll begin setting up for their OMS 2 burn, they'll check their targeting. What kind of burn do I want? And once they decide that, then they'll go in and make sure that they either input or, uh, in some cases, uh, that the targets are already there that they're looking for in the software. Uh, they're going to take the main engine and shut, uh, it's still using, the, the controllers on the main engine still using uh, uh, some electrical power, and so they're going to shut them off. You obviously don't need those anymore, and you're also going to close up uh, the main engine helium system, which is used uh, during ascent to pressurize the engines. Uh, we're going to, uh, even though we did this uh, main propulsion system dump to get propellants out of the vehicle, well, we're in a perfect vacuum. And it's possible that we didn't get everything out that we wanted to. So what we're going to do is we can go in and manually uh, open up some of those valves. And uh, they're going to set up the uh, main propulsion system so that the vacuum can come in there and empty out those lines. And then there's some doors that were open on the bottom of the vehicle. Uh, the umbilical doors are basically doors that are open. If you think about it, you've got to have pipes going from the external tank up into the orbiter to feed that propellant up in there. Uh, but at the same time, when we come home for reentry, we really like tiles along the bottom. So what you do is you take doors, you put tiles on the bottom, and open them up like this and stick your pipes up through there. And now that we've gotten rid of the tank, we don't need any more, so we just close those doors up. And they want to make sure that that they get those things closed at this point. Uh, if we're doing an abort once around, then this is the point the checklist refers them to a different place. It says go to AOA procedures, which are slightly different. Uh, and in either case, then we start preparing for our ohms too. And they're going to move some of the ohms and RCS valves around to get ready for that. OK, once they've done this, now they're ready to uh, maneuver into attitude. Again, the software usually does this. Uh, if they're going on up into orbit, they'll take the MS seats, which are behind the CDR and the PLT seats, and put them up, get them out of the way, gives them more room in the cabin. Uh, we're going to stop uh, the uh, vacuum inerting terminate. We've had the, the main engine system open for about 30 minutes, so in that time interval, if anything was still there, it should be gone. So we close everything up at that point, and then we're going to set up our burn cards, just like we did for OMS 1. Burn card and burn monitor card, and uh, then we go execute our OMS 2, and then we have, again, just like we did for ohms 1, post ohms 2. And they just check out the gimbals on the ohms engine, and now they come down here and start reconfiguring the ohms and RCS system for on orbit. We've made our burn, so we know we're going up. I mean, there's some different software and RCS features that we'd like to utilize, so we're going to move some valves around so that we can do that. Uh, and then uh, we're going to go into the software coast mode while we go through and start preparing the rest of the orbiter systems for on orbit. Okay. Uh, and all those procedures are in a checklist that we call the post-insertion checklist. Okay. Any questions about anything? Okay. Uh, that's the first part of the briefing. I think you and I both would do a little better with the break, so if you'll take about five minutes, we'll make it ten after, and come back and we'll go through S and aborts. <laughs>